I decided I would go back to a talk I gave a couple of few months ago in Exeter and modify it a bit. And uh, we we obviously do quite a lot of these what is Julia, who is she type talks. So uh, so it's not too difficult. So there's a few at the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes on Julia. Uh, and then at, for the last 10 or so minutes, then I will um, I'll talk about some projects. OK, uh, quickly, since you've obviously all read Avic's CV, I thought I'd just say who I was. OK, so I did maths and chemistry as an undergraduate, and then I did doctoral work combining both on modeling gas uh, for 70s, 70s. So I look that old, <laughs> thank you. Anyway, um, so yeah, so like most people in our department, I managed to blow up the lab because uh, I was really a mathematician. Uh, I've taught a couple of times. I taught Mac Eng at Brighton and computing medical physics at Imperial. But in between, I formed a consultancy uh, and we worked in London, Boston, Rome and Munich. So we only picked nice places to work. Uh, we were focused mainly on aerospace, health, finance. And over that time, 70s is a long time ago, uh, we've used in excess of 20 different computing languages in anger, i.e. we got paid for using them rather than just because we were things. So, uh, uh, and lots of databases. I'm actually more interested in databases than computer languages. So the first language I wrote was Algol as an undergrad. I used Fortran for my doctoral work. Uh, but my go-to languages are C, Perl, which used to be called Perl 5, but now I can call it Perl again, and Ada. We actually, uh, we wrote some Ada. And of course, Julia. Uh, in terms of Julia, I formed the London Julia Computing Group in 2012. Yeah, but I'll try and remember. Um, so Julia was at point two then, just going into point three. Um, I wrote a book and I've been struggling with my publishers to try and get the second edition out. Uh, uh, and the other thing is I, I've run the HPC, the High Performance Computing Group for Finance and Quants for a while. So that's me. It's my life in a minute. Okay. Anyway, let's talk about uh, languages. So here's a list of languages, um, starting with Fortran, Lisp C, um, Perl, that's Perl, Perl 4, I guess, uh, is around here. Perl 5 is 1999. All right, yeah. Uh, Python, which is very popular now, is actually nearly 30, is that 30 years old? Yeah, 20, 28 years old, Python. Uh, but it only took off in the last 10. R, which I guess you know R is a uh, S lookalike, is that um, Java, Scala, Rust, Go. Julia's right at the bottom here. And Swift. Actually, the good days for new languages were the noughties. Not much has happened in the last 10 years. So, um, so that's a list of languages. You'd like a language to do all those things um, that says the. And of course, Julia does them all. Wouldn't you know? Yeah. Anyway, uh, okay, so Julia's timeline uh, it started off as an MIT project. Uh, in 2010, so it's quite a mature uh, young lady, but it went open source in 2012. Uh, as I say, I formed the group at the end of 2012 in the December, um, when it was at point two. Um, first GSOC projects were 214. Um, Julia Computing is a commercial wing, a bit like Red Hat is you know, for um, the operating system, like Fedora and CentOS. Um, so it was formed to try and raise money and actually do consultancy work because it is still open source. Last year, we had Julia Con here uh, in London at UCL. And actually, the Americans loved it so much that next year we're going to be in Lisbon. So, um, so 
Julia Conn comes back to uh, Europe. Uh, at the same time, uh, the day, the same day that Julia Conn was in London, version one was released. So there was a lot of pressure to try and get the version stabilized. See why in a minute. Uh, and then the only other thing is the Julie developers, three guys um, called uh, Jeff Besenson, Stefan Kaplinski, and Viral Shah, uh, they won what's called the Wilkinson Prize for numerical computing, which isn't a thing that's done every year. I think it's only been awarded twice. Okay, so it's, it's quite a prestigious award, and they won that. So that's the timeline for Julia. Um, why learn it? Well, it's actually simple to learn. Uh, it looks like MATLAB. Anybody familiar with MATLAB-ish type stuff? Good. Okay, well. Uh, so people used to think it was a MATLAB clone. And when it was first developed, um, it, it was seen to be targeting scientific computing. Okay. But it isn't a clone. However, if you can write MATLAB, then you have no trouble in writing Julia. Uh, like Perl 6, Julia is written in Julia, almost. Obviously, because it runs on different operating systems a little bit, uh, which has got to interface with the disk or whatever, or the memory, which is operating system dependent. So what they do is they create a shared library, essentially, um, for each different operating system. Uh, and most of the stuff's written in Julia. So like integers are written in Julia. Strings, which is also Unicode, are written in Julia. Floating points written in Julia. Um, so the whole thing it has an interesting type system. I'll show you a quick one, which is hierarchical. It implements object-oriented aggregation. It isn't um, po uh, polymorphic. It, the inheritance isn't supplied in Julia. I've got slides on that. Um, it has genuine macros, I'll say a little bit about that, and it solves what's called the two language problem, and what it's known for is it is quick. Okay, so, how quick's quick? This is a set of, um, so we got some languages down the bottom here, uh, and up the side here, you have to, it's a logarithmic scale. Okay, so each, each one is 10 times slower. Okay, so good is around here. Uh, everything's scaled to C. Okay, so C equals one. Um, so it clusters, you can probably see, does this work? This, oh, it does. Oh, I'm not sure it's going to pick up on the screen. Uh, that things like R, Python, Mathematica are can be in the region of 100 times or more slower uh, than, uh, than Julia. OK, um, this is for a set of well-known Intel benchmarks. Um, the, the thing is that you've got to slightly be aware of benchmarks. Um, the Julia people are quite good, actually, because they provide under slash performance on the site. Um, the machine that they were all run on, the code you can run against, so you can run them yourself. Okay, and this is gives you some idea of, of, of the sorts of times uh, that we're getting for those benchmarks. And actually, you can probably see that some of these, including recursive Fibonacci sequence, uh, Mandelbrot sets, are actually lower, better than the C compiler. Okay. Uh, and the reason for that usually is because certainly Fortran and also the Julia have a very good code optimizer. Okay, so you look at the code and you can see whether or not uh, it's been done um, to your liking. Um, but the compiler may well optimize your code better. Fortran is particularly good. Uh, so, so that's why we get some numbers here that are lower than one. But the big numbers are obviously things like R, uh, 260 times slower, Python, 90 times slower in working out uh, Fibonacci sequence by recursion. Okay. 
So um, the key features of Julia is it was designed from the beginning for high performance. It's got networking built in. Um, the, the programs compile to native code, and I'll show you a slide on that in a minute, so I won't say it now. Uh, it's dynamically typed, i.e. it works out the type from the context, but you can statically type it as well. Uh, it's provided under a very liberal license, the MIT license, which means it's free for everybody, including the documentation and the code and the images and everything else. You can use it. You don't have to, uh, you, know, you can use it in your own stuff. And all the source code, because it's written in Julia, is available to look at, which is quite good, actually, because you can see how other people have done things. And it's not just Julia source code, but all the modules are on GitHub, and you can look at the modules uh, and see how other people did it. So you can uh, work out uh, and get a good idea. Uh, so, so, right, so just try and work out why it's quick. Okay, so starts with a script, all right? Um, it turns that into a kind of intermediate representation, a bit like Java does, okay? Uh, uh, but then it uses a thing called the low-level virtual machine compiler to create machine code for that machine, totally transparently to the user. Okay, um, so all you need really to, to run Julia is a C compiler to create the shared library and an LLVM. So it, it runs on most of the things you'd think of, Windows, Max, Linux, uh, Android, Raspberry Pis, you know, everything that's, you know, anything that has an LLV compiler and a C, a C compiler. The LLVM project was uh, uh, started at uh, University of Illinois uh, in 2003, so it's actually a separate uh, project. Uh, and it's used in another languages. If you use one of these, um, then the C compiler, Clang, is actually LLVM. And that's because the guy who created LLVM went off to work for Apple. Uh, and he also wrote Swift. Everybody familiar with Swift? It's used for um, iPhones, essentially for writing apps on iPhones. So they got him, and so so Apple use LLVM. Uh, as I say, Julia caught Sims. There is an overhead, of course. If you're compiling on the fly, then the first time you compile is, is relatively slow, but relatively, I mean, if you've got something that's 50 or 100 times faster in execution, then you can live with it. Okay, so this is what happens. You get some code, you... Um, you work it out, you produce intermediate code, and then it's turned into assembly. So a normal, say, Java compiler or any compiler would only get this far. It would produce a jar file or whatever. And then the runtime system, and I guess Perl 6 does that, the runtime system kicks in to interpret the, uh, the intermediate code. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, especially on the JVM version. The well, I know that the Morbian version can get right down to the native. Okay, but Julia, yeah, I mean, you can actually write LLVM and compile it uh, intermediate, but uh, so so we get the standard thing with native code at the bottom, which falls out. Um, now, I've only got two slides with code on, so uh, this is multiple dispatch in a minute. Okay, so this is a, a Julia function to increment x. x isn't typed, so it's a generic function. We don't say it's an integer, we don't say it's a real number, and we add one to it. Now, the native code it produces is that. That's one line of machine code to actually add one, there's the one, and, and return the number, which runs in nanoseconds. Uh, there's a little bit of a no-op here just to 
make sure it finishes up on a word boundary. If you add set put 1.0, then you get totally different machine code um, because you're creating the code at runtime. So that funny number there is actually 1.0 as a e to the minus zero. It's the floating point representation. And we get a different machine instruction, but it's still quite small. Okay. Um, so it, this allows Julia to dispatch on its arguments, which is called multiple dispatch, which you mentioned. Okay, so when you create a function, a generic function, you will get different code depending on whether or not you, what type of arguments you use. And if you define your own function type here, um, or as long as it's got the plus operator, it knows how to add something to it. So complex numbers, rational numbers, there's the code for a rational number, uh, 17 divided by seven, which is a lot longer, but actually if you think about each one of those in nanoseconds, it's quite, it's not a very big bit of code. So the other thing actually I sh should add about Julia is there is no difference between built-in types and your types. Because remember, Julia's written in Julia. So integers, real numbers, everything else are written in Julia. So if you write some Julia, uh, then it isn't differentiated in terms of the performance of using that. Okay, um, so we saw right at the beginning my splash slide that I got from Avic, um, that it solves what's known as the two language problem. So this is, the fact that there are scripting languages, the ones on the right, which are dynamic, they're interpreted, and they're slow, but they're easy to use. So basic was the first. Um, Python, R, uh, Perl, I guess, is a scripting language, the original, yeah. Whereas system languages, Fortran C, you run them through a compiler, in the end you finish up with code, uh, and uh, so those are have static types, which are determined at compile time normally, um, and they're fast, but they're harder to use. So what usually happens is that when you're solving a problem, you, your users, your data scientists or whatever, work in some sort of REPL, uh, and they do the work, but then it gets turned into Fortran or C or uh, whatever. And um, it, in some ways, if you're the data science, you, you sort of lose the um, control of the project then, because it's no longer down to you. Uh, and then that gets, uh, taken from that and created by something that's going to run on the problem. Whereas in Julia, of course, because Julia creates code straight away, then you don't have that intermediate step. Uh, and also the analysts and the developer are really the same. So even if you're a better analyst than you are a developer, you can look at what the developer is doing and you can understand their code. Yeah, so you might need a bit of hand on some of the more esoteric things. But um, but so so this is the the two language problem. Uh, I'm going to probably skip this a bit. So Ju Julia has an interesting type uh, type system. Um, as I said, there's no distinction between built-in types uh, I, and the ones you define yourself in terms of speed of execution. Um, there's no concept of inheritance. Um, it uses what's known as an aggregated um, object oriented system, uh, which means that essentially you've got aggregates here, but the concrete types are the ones under the line, and those are the ones that have methods. Once you, once you make a type concrete and define the kind of methods you can use with it, you can't have subtypes of those inheriting those methods. Uh, I'll skip that. Okay, so Julia's um, got a macro system, 
because the the at the core is a Lisp interpreter. One of the guys, one of the three guys, wrote a Lisp interpreter called Femto Lisp uh, before he worked on Julia, and that's the thing that actually converts the script into um, intermediate code or does the initial parsing of it, uh, which means that you can define macros, and those are genuine runtime macros. Um, some packages, because some developers are better at writing macros than others, uh, and they make very heavy use of macros. Um, one of the big areas, which I'm not going to talk about today, is machine learning, but um, certainly the guy who's done a lot of work in machine learning, who is a Brit, called Mike Innes, uh, he's really good at macros, and if you look at his code, you'll find it's littered with very good macros. Okay, um, some advanced features, and then we'll look at a few projects. Uh, Julia has a source level debugger. That sounds like pretty straightforward until you actually think that the code, the, the source is written as in the script and the code is, is compiled. So tying up the code to the script so you can step through the script is actually quite hard. And the Julia guys have worked with the LLVM to put handles in so that they can um, work and actually provide a step-by-step -step debugger with work, watch points and um, evaluation at each step. As of 1.4, which is just in well, RC3, I think, it's got genuine threading, sort of C-style threads, um, which been around a lot in the early Linux ones, but they had a lot of trouble getting it to getting genuine threads to work under Windows. And one of the raison d'etre is that it has to run on, on all operating systems. So it's always been termed experimental, but no. So there is genuine threading uh, rather than sort of cooperative threads that most things have. Julia packages are very efficient. Flex, which is this machine language written by Mike, has about a thousand lines of code written in Julia. It's a machine learning neural network code. The C code, which is TensorFlow, which Python uses as a wrapper, has about a hundred thousand lines of code. Okay, so there's uh, it's one percent the size of um, of TensorFlow. Julia has got wrapper packages around TensorFlow. If you're wooed to TensorFlow. A lot of the packages now, if you've got a GPU and it detects that there's a GPU, it'll use the GPU. If it, if it doesn't have a GPU, it'll run on the CPU. And that's very good for developing machine learning languages, but then when you port them, you don't have to do anything. It's totally transparent. It'll use the CPU. And Julie's actually working with Google on the TPU. Anybody? Familiar with TPUs? Good, right. This is Google's Tensor processing unit, which you can't buy. I don't think you can buy them yet, can you? You can get them? It's only in the cloud, isn't it? I mean, you have to rent. I thought you had to rent two. No, it's a smaller version. It's like a Okay. Oh, good, right, okay. Well, Google, Julie had been working with Google on uh, big TPUs uh, and doing some work. Okay, um, so uh, just quick five minutes and I'll look at some projects. Uh, so Julie has had a problem, uh, a kind of schizophrenic problem of trying to work out where its niche was in the world. Python seems to have taken over data science. Okay, it's a very simple uh, language. Uh, Julie is actually quite a good language for data science. It's got some nice um, uh, libraries and things, but Python and R, to a lesser extent, uh, seem to be favoured. So I see it as it's merged back as a scientific language and it's gone high end with machine learning and with um, networking very high. So these are high end. Um, a lot of financial work. This is the, the book I'm writing with AVIC. 
Um, he's written a lot of the financial stuff because he works for Julia. Uh, some biomedical, parallel processing, large scale data science. Uh, and the, there's a, I'll make these slides available. Uh, so there's a, there's a, uh, a link to the case studies that gives you all the, the nice things here. So, um, so these are mainly financial because that's what I'm interested in. Um, the NY Fed um, had the models written in MATLAB and they started using Julia in 2015 when Julia was still 0.5. They had a lot of trouble because they've gone from four to five and five to six and six to seven. Uh, seven was an intermediate step up to 1.0. However, they've persisted and they claim that they get at least 10 times faster performance uh, in Julia than they do in MATLAB for free, of course, because MATLAB is not free. If anybody's ever used it, you will know it's not free. So that's the Fed. Um, BlackRock. BlackRock actually started doing some work uh, in 2014, uh, but it was so BlackRock have a uh, a product called Aladdin. If you do BlackRock.com/Aladdin, you'll get to hear all about that, um, which is used by its analysts, uh, and they've been uh, using Julia for. Uh, uh, as a replacement for Aladdin, which is now totally written in Julia. Uh, this is Aviva, and it's British. I mean, i.e. it's being done in London, rather than, I know Brit Aviva aren't necessarily British. Uh, so this is actually done uh, by a guy called Hank Tom Thornton, who uh, is very keen on Julia. He's been, uh, uh, he's given a talk, uh, keynote, I think, at, uh, at a Julia meeting. Uh, on solvency. Solvency 2 is uh, regulation after the banks crashed and people worried about whether they'd crash again. All right, so lots of stringent rules came out um, for actually applying to solvency and um, Aviva are using Julia totally for the solvency 2 modeling. Um, uh, this is uh, Conning. Conning are in Connecticut, oh, well, they're also, also at London Bridge, but they're at Connecticut. Uh, and they've done some work, statistical work. Um, the original thing was running K. Anybody know what K is? All right, good, all right. Okay, it's this Arthur Whitney language based on APL, uh, which is supposed to be blindingly fast. Uses Okay, and it certainly, well, if you've ever run a, actually APL is one of my languages, so um, yeah. Anyway, so they used to say only Arthur Whitney could write K. So if he got knocked down by a bus, God help <laughs> all the banks that are using it. But the banks are very keen on KX databases and K. Anyway, they're claiming that uh, the Julia code is between four and 10 times faster uh, than the uh, than the Arthur Whitney style K. And significantly more readable, as you say. <laughs> it couldn't be less readable than uh, than K, which is based on A plus, which is based on APL. Okay, so, uh, and then this is this isn't thing, but I thought I'd put this up, and then I think we're just about finished. Um, Celeste uh, was a. I've got this written down actually. Because I'm put back and forth. Okay, so in the observatory in New Mexico uh, had this digital sky survey uh, of. 500 million stars and galaxies. Okay, and they, they've been spending years, 16 years, trying to catalog these. Okay, so they work with Julia on a big um, network with petaflop computers. So they say, uh, and they got it to work. So Lawrence Livermore and Berkeley, as well as Julia. So they spent, and they did it in 13 minutes. So 16 years became 30 minutes. I mean, obviously it took more than 30 minutes to get the thing working. So Julie's very good at running parallel networking, whatever. So Celeste was last year, I think, or the year before. So uh, yeah, um, oh, as you can see, they've got 
It's run on Julia on 650,000 CPUs <laughs> networked together. God, yeah, never mind. Okay. Um, there are some other things. If you go to the, my link, Julia Computing, um, some interesting one. Uh, the Fed are using it for uh, traffic control collisions. Now, you might worry about that, but remember, air traffic control collisions are written in ADA at present. So you have to be thankful that there are some, since I don't write ADA anymore, that there are still some ADA programmers around every time you fly. Think about ADA component. Anyway, it's, they're, they're, they're looking at writing uh, air traffic control in, uh, in Julia. Talk about the Fed, self-driving cars. I don't believe in self-driving cars, but never mind. Uh, and 3D printers, all that's online. And uh, there's usually talks, if you look at the, Julia summits, you can get talks on those. Um, uh, just to say, everybody says, oh, there's 10,000 packages in Python or know, whatever, but there's only about 15 ever used. <laughs> 20 if you're lucky. So Julia had, when we launched the thing, uh, 1,800 packages. It's now about 2,500, but those are actually registered with Julia. There's probably as many packages, again, that people just have on their own GitHub, which you can find by Googling them. So, so you know, so Julia's got lots of packages, and it's quite easy to write wrappers. Um, so final thoughts. Julia is, isn't just quick execution. What one language can do, another language can do. Um, however, uh, all the other stuff, the... the static dynamic typing, the multiple dispatch, it's very hard to retrospectively add that to an existing language. So the Python guys have tried to add just-in-time um, compilation, but they find that the existing architecture gets in the way. So it isn't that easy. Now, I don't know, are you familiar with Number, which uh, Continuum, who do the uh, um, Anaconda, they, they produce this thing where you can say at JIT, and then you can JIT certain bits of code. But they seem to have dropped their interest in it. Okay. Uh, so, Julia, this is just where all the work is. So, East and West Coast, as you imagine, obviously Boston, MIT are at Boston, so. but also Berkeley and LA. Uh, UK. The French aren't terribly interested in it, but the Germans, the Austrians, and the Benelux people uh, are quite interested. And then the Asian corridor. Uh, India is because Viral Shah is Indian, one of the three, so he's in Bangalore. Uh, but uh, Chinese are getting interested in it too. I guess, I guess Mr. Trump is uh, going to be using it for some of his uh, things. And that's it. Okay. Machine learning. I was just, I personally have a question as well. Julia sounds like data scientists and machine learning. Mm. Why, why aren't they doing it? Why, why, why does everyone need to ask? And the other thing is that Julia seems to support my accelerated info 16 over the way numerically converts. Yes. Yes, it does, yeah. I mean, you, you can, well, because you define your own, use 32-bit because your GPUs are 32 bits. that's what you mean. Yeah, oh, oh yes, yes, you, the, 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 the reduction thing, yeah. Yeah, there are packages that use that. Um, well, I mean, it's a, Python is the new basic, really. Okay. Um, well, no, no, uh, but it's got a small footprint. It fits on a Raspberry Pi. Kids are going to learn it at school, like you le we learned basic on uh, on the BBC computers. Um, a lot of people are leaving Excel because Excel is almost impossible. They're analysts. They work in the treasury or whatever. They don't want to be, be programmers. So Python represents uh, the fact that once they hit the wall, they've got to go to somebody to write them a, a package if they can't find one. Um, so even with machine learning, TensorFlow is the big Python package, which I say is a wrap around this big, you know, and the Theano was being pushed before that. Um, 
Mm -hmm. No, it's, there are uh, Python's old TensorFlow now. As I said, there is a wrapper package because Julia is very easy to write. It interfaces directly to its own shared library. It also interfaces in the same way to um, uh, to any shared library. You know, they're all exactly the same. Yep. Yeah. It's not taking a whole program. No, it is. Julia's taking a whole program. But how can you do it just in time? You can't do global optimization when you require the whole program. The whole point of global As you would imagine, my answer is yes and no. <laughs> okay, it has a thing that they invented called generated functions, which uh, are macros, but they're, they're macros that write macros once they know what the data is. Okay, so depending on your data, they can write different code further down the chain. Okay, and that's one way you can optimize your code. Everybody says, if you can't think of a reason for using generated functions, don't. <laughs> but there are a lot of good stuff in the standard libraries using arrays and things which are optimized. Most of the optimization does depend on LLVM, which actually is get better. So as you said, as the Perl 6 thing gets better, well, certainly applies to Julia. So the big, the big um, problem with Julia is that it is the, the actual compilation step. I mean, if you've got something that runs in a second rather than 100 seconds, then the fact it might take a couple of more seconds the first time doesn't seem much, but people complain about things like that. And if that is recognized, and the idea is that in version two, uh, they are looking at trying to get the compilation time up. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's the nearest I can get to an answer. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah? Oh, good. Which one? Oh, well, actually, that was done. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, that was done by my um, niece. So it was done by a lady. But she was working in Soho for a men's magazine, which might actually have some reason <laughs> why, why she felt it was appropriate. <laughs> Well, inappropriate. Well, she felt it was appropriate. But I mean, so my niece is, my niece is a very uh, talented girl, but uh, well, she's not young anymore. But anyway, she was working in Soho for a men's magazine, which is which is no more. Okay. Anyway, go. Cool. Um, what do you mention the LVM and stuff like? Sorry, I mentioned it on my phone, and it turns out more VMs using it. Okay. Yeah. LLVM. <laughs> the guy who wrote LLVM is a very thing, uh, interesting yeah. guy, and as I say, that's why Apple has moved from Apple. One more. Hmm? Yeah, that's right. The, what's his name? Chris Letner. Yeah. Yeah. Exact maths. Yeah, so like it's like in in, in, in Lisbon speaking call it's like called the numeric power, but really the baseline is can it do exact maths on rational numbers? So Well, it has a rational it has a rational uh I've to find out about Julia is um whether it whether it does that by default, or do you have to do special types in order to get the exact maths or is it 
Well, you can define your own type if you find it doesn't. There are packages like combinatorics packages and whatever in Julia, um, but you'd have to look at those. I mean, and there are, there's lots of user groups. And people talk to you very easily. What? No, um, you have to look at, I mean, for instance, if you divide two integers in Julia, you get a ratio, you get a real. You don't get an integer. There is an integer division function, but you get a real. But you always get the same type in Julia. It's, it's, it's strict that it doesn't give you different types for different in different scenarios. Okay, but you need to look at the packages, talk to the people, have a look at what the groups are doing. But there are works on, but there is a rational number package. Any? Okay. <laughs> the, the other thing is Julia, it, the, the Julia core team produces a thing called Julia DB, uh, which handles very large data sets uh, distributed, uh, mainly in files. And you might find that useful. I don't know what your data is, but you might find that it, it, it's... So look at Julia DB and, and see what they've been doing. That. So that's one of their flagship ways of, of talking to data. And there's, you find ju just Julia DB on site. Okay, can we do one more or not? Um, it's desperate. Um, I'll, do, I'll do a quick answer. It's a quick question. Go, I'll do a quick answer. Because of most people who either are experts or have aspired to be experts in in R, they have Python. So how difficult is it for those guys to transition? I guess it's about packages. Python not different. I I. Don't find R easy, easy actually. Never have. Um, uh, but Python, pretty, pretty. I mean, syntactically, Python is very, very simple. Uh, so you're actually going up. You're not moving around differently. As I say, if you know MATLAB, then it's pretty much exactly the same. You know. But um, yeah. So uh, so pretty, pretty straightforward. However, you know, I wouldn't say that there's a great. Uh, uh, there's quite actually a few people hiring in the US, uh, but uh, only Aviva and a couple of other places around the city as yet. But who knows? Might get better. Okay, sorry about that. Uh,